We are Flame. We want to show you some artworks that look at the way the internet interferes with art. We're showing three sets of paintings at the Franz House Museum in the current exhibition Image Power, and we would like to say a few things about them. Before we start on the paintings, we want to tell you about Flame. When we came up with it in 2010, the internet as a medium had not yet solidified, and things still felt quite open. We thought of Flame as the eye of a computer rifling through the internet. So at some point in 2014, we started painting sets of appropriations called art stacks. Our first art stack was made up of four Mark Rothkos stacked on top of each other like a tail. Then we defaced them with a burrito. The next stack was a set of four Pollocks increasing in size. We defaced them too with a statement from Tumblr, which summed up a lack of feeling from the computer screen. We went on to do Eve clients with this original blue Pikmin in the style of Jasper Jones' Three Flags. One has a Jeff Koons gazing ball stuck through it on the tip of a pole, and the other one a Damien Hirst skull. This time you're not just staring into an infinite space, but also into an infinite zoom. For us it made no sense to generate new meaning from scratch, so we tried to use what was already there. Even though all cultural information can be instantly available, cultural value is still mostly based on widespread popularity and visibility. You see the way the internet works is that if you make new content it just disappears on the outskirts of Google. What is visible ends up being obvious and simple, so we took trending art references and tried to interfere with them instead. Three of these art stacks are now on show at the Franz Hals Museum. The first one is called Slideshow. This specific installation is a cluster of five very recognisable paintings arranged like the image browser of a Mac computer in 2016. On the left there's a Kandinsky, which is the most viewed artwork of all time on the Guggenheim website. Next to it is a Christopher Wuhl, whose word stencil series have prices that were escalating rapidly at the time. On the very right is a Mark Rothko, his red paintings are his most expensive, probably due to China's lucky color being red. Next to it is one of Damien Hirst's spot paintings. There are about 2,000 of these in circulation, which is possibly one of the biggest series of works ever made. The painting in the middle is a Ferdinand Leger, and we chose that one because we didn't want to choose a Picasso. What this arrangement does formally is it piles up these paintings as a stream of images, putting them on the same ontological level. At the same time, it resizes the images to fit the screen, so 800 by 600 pixels, for example. So we scaled our paintings to fit these screen proportions, which distorts them. In reality, the Rothko would be a lot bigger than the Hearst. Another thing this composition reminds you of is that there's an endless amount of images and data stacked underneath the visible crest that you see. It is an abstract visualization that mirrors the layered architecture in which data itself is organized. So what you see is the general inflation of images online, and then the real-world inflation of these paintings that are copied, reproduced and exchanged endlessly. The art that you see online may not be the art itself, but it's dispatched to you. The second painting on view is called Amazon from 2018. It takes critics' pics and puts them together as if an algorithm had suggested them to you. So the main picture is originally by Martin Kippenberger from his Raft of Medusa series, in which he portrays himself as a shipwrecked artist who uses his own body to absorb the woes of society. Underneath, you see suggestions that allegedly understand your taste. So if you like Kippenberger, you might also like this picture by Mike Kelly, a watercolor by Paul Tech, a painting by Francis Picabia, or one by Lee Lozano, whose screw painting's phallic form has been accidentally cut off at the tip by the browser window. If you follow these machine learning choices, you come pretty close to what is expected from an expert opinion without having one. So in the end, carefully crafted curating that took years to work out ends up turning into network trends. The last painting on view is called The Origin of German Tragic Drama, or The German Geist, and it deals with pattern recognition. Imagine a computer program scanning through 500 years of German painting, looking for similar patterns that reproduce themselves like a meme, then finding in them what could be described as a diffuse melancholic romanticism of male figures contemplating nature. The blueprint for this idea is Albrecht Dürer's Melancholia, chiseled 14 years after he painted the first self-portrait in history in 1500. Its prime example is Caspar David Friedrich's Wander Above the Sea of Fog, painted in 1818. A similar longing, although in comradeship, can be seen painted by Kirchner in Alpath after thunderstorm in 1900. Then, in 1965, Georg Baselitz, Der Neue Typ, has the lone figure as a broken man. Finally, we have again a self-deprecating Martin Kippenberger self-portrait from 1988, which seemed like a fitting ending to the pattern. What happens next in the German Geist, no one knows. 
but maybe it's time for something new. The dilemma of machine learning is that it leads to classifying objects into clichés, whilst reinforcing the thought that we would be nothing more than them because nothing else is on offer. For example, when the bot Tay was let loose on Twitter, the more it learned, the narrower its perspective got, resulting in meme-generated prejudice. Similarly, if we adapt our consumption of art to the logic of how it is organized on the net, we will fall into the similar problem of reproducing preconceived ideas repeatedly. These art stacks are adopting some of the methods computers use to process cultural artifacts as data. Susan Blackmore tells us that the third replicator after genes and memes would be called dreams. Dreams are what sponges off our activity, creating a culture that wants to propagate itself. Many internet trends are actually dreams, and Flame's function is to try and do something with the conclusions they make of us. For example, the burrito Rothkos were painted at a time when the art market was developing flip art as a genre, so it was like the invisible hand of the market had created its own art form. Later Flame, as with this painting, uses the voice of the market to command a programming language to suggest painting to follow its established rules. Similarly, the art stack Amazon uses the perspective of an algorithm as a way of imitating the taste of a broader critical consensus. These dreams are voices of the internet that often carry out some form of power or what the critical art ensemble in 1996 saw as a nomadic electronic flow. So conclusively, maybe we could say that for the art stack series we're appropriating all of these paintings on the surface, but we're also appropriating various mechanisms and social dynamics of the internet. These mechanisms often work against us as artists and individuals, so to harness and reconfigure them in our favour would be a kind of art for us. Thank you for listening to our talk.